All right, everybody, welcome back to the History Road Show. Again, I am Julie Zasada, the Executive Director here at the Sear Lake Historical Association. And last month, as you know, three weeks ago only, as we figured out, we presented on Beatrice Horner Castro Giovanni, our first town historian. And that program is recorded on our YouTube page, so that can be watched online if you missed that program. Today, we're going to talk about Florence Wahlberg. She was a civic leader and businesswoman in our community, and I think you're going to sense a lot of parallels to be as well in her sense of uh, community strength and all that. It's really interesting. In January, we'll talk about Senator Sue Lansky. In February, We'll be doing Geraldine Cordacrax, and then in March it's going to be Dr. Robert Cakes. We have three more of these to get through this winter. Um, of course, I have to say something on my t-shirt, right? I have another little, little advertisement here. So the Calumet National Heritage Area is an initiative that would earn the Calumet Region recognition designated by Congress as a place where natural, cultural, and historic resources combine to form a cohesive, nationally important landscape. So there's approximately 60 of these throughout the nation, and we are trying to get the Calumet region designated as a heritage area. So under this initiative, Sear Lake Historical Association participated in a collaborative partnership to develop a traveling exhibition called Calumet Voices National Stories. Now, Several artifacts from Cedar Lake went up to the Gary Library, were placed on display as part of the Lake County face of this project. We had a beautiful grand opening in January, and then we were promptly shut down by the lockdown. So, we were kind of sad about that. Everything was up there. We had worked over a year to get this presentation pulled together for everybody. And now, what we've done is there's an online exhibition. So you can view photographs from it, see some of the different things that we have curated and brought together. And then last month, on November 17th, I did a presentation for the Dunes uh, organization. And so there is, from our website homepage, which is cedarlakehistory.org, if you go there, there's a link to the YouTube video clip that I was a part of, the presentation that I was a part of, as well as the calumetvoicesexhibit.com um, uh, exhibition website so that you can see all the different things that we have on display. And, and like I said, all of our hard work. And I have little handouts too on the table about what that National Heritage Area is about um, and the, the borders here. So I can show you some of that after the program is done. But we're very, very proud of our participation in that program. And then before I formally begin this afternoon, a couple more reminders for you. First, as I shared last month, we are in the midst of collecting memories, right? We're getting all the pictures from Cedar Lake citizens and visitors and, and gathering all of those that will be compiled in a journal that we keep here at the museum. So see me after the program. If you're going to do a video, share, share your memories on a piece of paper, send me an email, give me a phone call, whatever you want to do to jot that memory down. And I want to make a public service announcement because something just came up on Facebook this past week where someone was asking, once again, pictures of a building. Does anyone know what this building used to look like? And I have to remind everyone, if you don't take the time to share the photographs now, we're never going to have them. You need to share them with us so that we can curate them. And when the inquiries come in, we can share those memories. The other thing, too, is document the town around us today, like how it looks right now. Because in 100 years, I don't intend to be here, right? I, I assume other people are going to be here, our children perhaps, I don't know, running the museum and answering these inquiries. And so I want to make sure that, not children, that's way too old, great-grandchildren perhaps, <laughs> will be running the organization. And I want to make sure that we're doing what we can today to preserve preserve all the memories now so that when they do inquire, we have something to share with them. So, you know, our consultant says, after the shutter opens and closes, that moment in time is history. So it's never too early to start sharing your memories of Cedar Lake history with us here at the association. So please be our partner in preservation in that way. And I also want to encourage you, if you want to be a partner in preservation, through volunteerism. You know, just because the museum is closed for the winter doesn't mean we don't have projects going on. And, you don't have to be in the frozen tundra that is the museum. I'll find other ways to help you um, become involved. Or when we do reopen in May, if you want to become a tour guide, if you want to become involved with our special events, things like that, let's talk now. Let's not wait all the way until May. Let's bring you on board and, and let you learn more about Cedar Lake history and become a part of our team um, over the winter. So please reach out to me if you have any questions about getting uh, involved. Now, we'll begin with Florence Helena Weert Wahlberg. Uh, Florence was born on March 12th of 1914 in Chicago to Ignatius and Anna Weert. Um, he was in the dry goods business 
And in Steel Shavings, which is a history book about Cedar Lake that was published in 97, we have the treasure of Florence's own words, which is, of course, always my favorite. She writes, my father came to South Chicago from a little village in Poland in the late 19th century. My mother met him in church where he was a choir director. Neither had much formal education. They spoke Polish at home, and I was eight years old before I began to speak English. By the 1920s, the family had moved to 517 Gosselin Street in Hammond. Her mother worked in Whiting and had gotten a place of business in Hammond. Florence continues, we came to Cedar Lake for the first time in 1930 when I was 16. My father had a great longing for a vacation place in Wyoming, but that was too far away for my mother. They saved their money and they bought five acres of land for Mr. Kinney on 143rd. That was virgin territory except for the cows who occupied it. It was the woods and there was a pond in back. It reminded my father of his home in Poland. As we came in, you could hear the meadow larks. We spent our summers here at the farm, as we called it. It was a lot of ground to city people. My father built a little house, and one beautiful December day, I saw snowflakes come while I was in the woods. I remember the silence was so great, it almost hurt your ears. She's really good with words. I thought that was a really interesting way to describe that. On this image here that you see on the screen, we have the early years there. That's Florence at age one in 1915. And then we have to fast forward all the way to 1936 when she was 22. I don't have any other photographs to share in between there. So these are the two earliest photographs that we have of Florence. And on the next slide here, here's this, the, we call it the, the cat, or they called it the castle house. So the land that they're speaking of, as you can see on the right hand side, if you're in south on 41, about as far south as the middle school, but on the other side of 41, that is where the, their property was located. So an excerpt from Florence's funeral memorial program states that her parents spent several years building this castle house in the woods. You can see why they call it that. Florence shared happy memories of driving on Route 41 from the family home in Hammond when it was only a dirt road, often with many ruts, in a 1927 Buick Coupe with her father. And then from the Lake County Interim Report of the Indiana Historical Sites and Structures Inventory, we learn the house is technically considered English cottage style, and by tax records, it appears that construction was finally completed in 1937. So knowing that they first came to Cedar Lake in, in 1930, spent several years in that small house that he had built on the property and doing the camping and whatnot, it, was, it took until 1937 that this house was, was completely constructed. I believe the home still remains with um, family members. I think Florence's niece lives in it today. So um, it is really, really charming, really pretty. And we found this picture, I think, also on the tax records. Now, you guys all know that our historian Scott is quite the researcher, right? He puts all this information together so that I'm able to present to you. He found this little Hammond Lake County Times article on the woman's page. March 14, 1931, it reads, A few of the friends of Miss Florence Weirt of Gosselin Street gathered at her home Thursday evening to honor her with a birthday dinner party. The guests were served at one large table decorated with a large birthday cake and a bouquet of sweetheart roses. Cards and music were enjoyed later. So this kind of reminds me of the modern day Facebook, right? The woman's page of the uh, newspaper. If we're going to reference the woman's page in another moment here. But that is apparently how they got their news and their information, their tidbits out before the modern, modern era that we have. I don't know that Facebook will still be around for us to curate these bits of information if someone wants to do programs about other people in the future. So that would be another reason to submit memories and information and commentary to, to the Historical Association. Uh, let's see what's next. So we celebrate her birthday. Oh, also, um, that was the same year. So March 14, 1931, that was her 17th birthday. Florence attended high school in Hammond, which we would expect being up there still. Scott found an article then from the following year, May 26, that states that Florence was cast in the senior play, The Truth for a Day. Her character, Ethel Clark, was described as the spoiled daughter of a socialite. <laughs> I've not heard anything more about this play, so I'm not sure if I have any of the details to share with you. But then on June 12, 1932, she graduated among 206 other classmates. And now... Was it Hammond High? It says Hammond it High School, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, yeah, that, that school does. Yeah, because it says HHS seniors, Hammond High School seniors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, back in the 30s. I, were any of the other high schools even operational as early as the 30s mm -hmm. in Hammond? I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the Hammond history. So. 
So steel shavings, just mentioned that recently. I'm going to read another excerpt from that, again, with a lot more of Florence's own words. Um, this publication was produced by James Lane from Indiana University Northwest. It's a collection of local history interviews that were conducted by IUN students paired with the writings of B. Horner. And it was organized by various topics. We have a copy here at the museum, so if you ever want to have a chance to sit down and read it, we'd love to loan it to you. I'm almost positive it's also available at the local Cedar Lake Library, probably just as a reference, not so much as you know, being able to check it out. But there are a lot of really interesting little stories about Cedar Lake history. So let me share some information with you um, that, again, Florence's own words. And when she mentions the gentleman by the name of Gus, Gus eventually became her husband, so I'll circle back around to him in one second. So she said, I started working in the Wahlberg camera shop in 1933 when I was 19 years old. I fell in love with the camera shop first and then him, meaning Gus. <laughs> People would come from Chicago on Friday and stay the weekend. They dropped their film off when they were on their way out and say, develop the film, Gus. We have it ready for them the following weekend. I didn't think there was much friction with Chicagoans who came on weekends. We welcomed them, and I think they envied us. Next door to the camera shop was a spring. People would fill their buckets with the water, which came from the hill. Mrs. Van Borstel would often come three times a day with her tar bucket. Route 41 had trucks, and we could hear them at times, but it was nothing intrusive. I knew Sam Bartlett. When I worked in the camera shop, his realty shop was just down the street. He was an entrepreneur and actually came to Gus and said, I have to make movies of this so I can take it back to Chicago people and tell them that we have a summer resort for them so they won't have to suffer the summer heat. He said, it's a gorgeous place, so we have to photograph it. He got a 16 millimeter camera and Gus worked with him on getting a promotional film made. And I believe that we do have a copy of this Bartlett promotional film on DVD, so I can share that with you as well sometime in the future. Um, really interesting to be able to see the community from, from, that, from that era. The beginning of the resort. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then Florence goes on to talk a little bit about the Depression years. So she says, we heard about the Depression, but I don't think Cedar Lake was as affected by it as people elsewhere. I never saw anyone begging for food, and I don't remember people being desperate. A lot of the year-round residents were farmers. Everyone managed. In the 30s, money went further. I remember going to Mary Stipe's grocery with a $5 bill and would come home with two brown bags of groceries and change in my pocket. I had bread, potatoes, and meat. During the 1930s, the government brought out surplus food, trucks with bread, slabs of pork, and beans. The man across the street said to Gus, I'm not going to eat that stuff. He'd bring a slab of pork and say, Gus, Give me a couple packs of cigarettes and I'll trade you this. <laughs> in 1937, when Gus went into Chicago, Florence opened a store in Crown Point. She said, I had a camera shop there and took appointments for sittings when Gus would be available. So like I said, let's circle back around to Gus, and I can tell you a little bit more about him. Gustav Wahlberg had come to Cedar Lake in 1922, camping up on the hill with his cousins and friends from Chicago. They bought an old army tent, a huge surplus mess tent from the war. His cousin's wife was the main chef. They slept overnight and stayed weekends. Then, Gus started a small camera shop in 1926 near Edgewater Beach, which I'm told is today's present day area where the town club has their like boat launching area. That's where I'm told that Edgewater Beach was at. A veteran of World War I, Gus learned photography beginning with tin types. As you already heard Florence explain, she knew Gus was the one when she first met the handsome <laughs> photographer. After requiring Florence to wait two years to marry, her parents finally decided their love must be true enough to allow the marriage. They were married on April 7th of 1937, and Florence's daughter told me that Gus was 40 at the time. And Florence was... Mm -hmm. 23, I think it was. Mm. Yeah, so that's a that's picture. That's a generation. I know. That's a lot I know. That. I know. Oh. Which I guess is maybe why mom and dad made her wait two years just to make sure, right? Um, Florence, here's here's the little excerpt, okay? Again, once again on the women's page, we have their, their wedding announcement. And it's so descriptive, I think it's kind of kind of sweet, so I'm going to read this to you. It says, Florence Work, Gustav Wahlberg, wed at St. Casimir's. Palms, roses, and snapdragons in attractive bouquets formed a background for the wedding on Wednesday afternoon of Miss Florence Weird, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Ignatius Weird of Goslin Street and Gustav Wahlberg of Cedar Lake that occurred at the rectory of St. Casper's Church. Father Lesniak read the ceremony at 2.30 o'clock 
<laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, am I reading this right? Miss Linnea Nelson was chosen by the bride as her maid of honor and appeared in an azure blue lace afternoon frock using a hat and sandals to match. The gown was made with a lace peplum jacket. Miss Nelson's flowers were a combination of gardenias and rosebuds. Becoming indeed was the rose-colored alcon lace and marquisette dress worn by the bride, for it was made with a full skirt on afternoon lines. I'm not sure what any of that means. I don't know anything about clothing. Um, yeah. Miss Work selected a pretty close-fitting hat made with a lace crown and a marquisette brim and boasting a shoulder-length veil. A single orchid worn at the v-neck of the bride's dress was an attractive addition to her out outfit. Edward Schmidt served Mr. Wahlberg as best man. About 50 guests were welcomed to the home of the bride after the ceremony, where a lovely dinner was served. Then, Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg left for their wedding trip that is taking them to Grand Rapids, where the bridegroom has friends the pair will visit. For her going away outfit, Mrs. Wahlberg wore a frock of the new thistle shade and combined with it a beige ballerina coat, a blue straw hat, and navy shoes. When they return to the region, the bride and bridegroom will reside at Cedar Lake, where their home is now under construction. Mr. Wahlberg, a well-known photographer, owns the photo art store in Crown Point and now also has an established business at Cedar Lake known as the Wahlberg Camera Shop. For the past two years, Mrs. Wahlberg managed the Wahlberg photo art store at Crown Point. Before that, she attended the Hammond High School and was interested in art that has served her well in a business way. Among the out-of-town guests, there for the wedding on Wednesday were Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Bukowski of Chicago, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Reed, and Mrs. F. Strauss, all of South Bend, Mr. and Mrs. Blaine of Cedar Lake, and Mr. and Mrs. Ed, looks like Deedle, of Crown Point. So, really, um, like I said, sweet way to explain the details and all that pre-Facebook era, right? When I mean, you can't post the picture necessarily. And they then go on to talk about um, the, the Honeymoon, like I said, at Grand Rapids, coming back. Life presented a lot of challenges, I am told, for the um, for the Wahlbergs in the early years of their marriage. I don't exactly have the details that defines what the challenges were, but they lived in a tiny wooden one-room cottage for five years before they had their first child. In that time, we read of Florence's early civic involvement. On February 14th, the Hammond Times noted that a junior women's club attended the theater. And so here's another little article to share with you. So. It says, a group of girls from the local junior women's club formed a theater party Tuesday night and attended the Gary Civic Theater showing of John Galsworthy's Escape, which starred Marshall Studness, a Gary youth. Following the play, Bremer Carlson, manager and director, took the group backstage and told them the mysteries of stage setting, makeup, casting, etc. Mrs. Gus Wahlberg of the Wahlberg Camera Shop at Cedar Lake and a member of the club took some flash pictures, which, where are they? Well, we would love to have them for the presentation, but anyway. Before separating to return to their various homes, the young ladies gathered at tables for refreshments. Mrs. Ada Letts, club president, was presented with a president pin at that time. Miss Helen, I cannot read her last name, bestowing it with much pomp. Those besides Mrs. Wahlberg, Miss Letts, and, and Mrs. the name that I can't read, who were in attendance, and then it goes on to list all the different people. And they talk about their guest, Mrs. Daly of California, the former Virginia Evans of this city. So really cute the way they did they describe everybody and gave their, you know, their surnames and things like that. So in August of that same year, um, Florence had also entered some of her photography in the Lake County Fair under the Amateur Photography Department and placed fourth under the miscellaneous category. And then we have another article that Scott found that details this 4-H club outing that was happening up at the Gary Dunes. Is that what it says? The Dunes site? Yes. And Florence was listed as... A camp instructor, let me see if I can find that part of the article. Classes are held each morning and goes on to talk about um, Mrs. Mrs. Florence Wahlberg at Cedar Lake as an instructor. And the picture, none of these pictures are Florence's, at least that's not how it's noted in the, um, in the article, it just as Hammond Times photographs. But I included it here, even though it doesn't include her because oh, they're really sweet. So the picture at the top right, I believe, was them laying out um, some sort of program of the camp, and then the girls in the cabin down below, everybody running along the shoreline at the Dunes Beach, and then a group shot as well um, up of the camp. So, 
Those people are fully clothed, right? Yes. Okay, because that's what it looks like, and I'm yes. like, they're going in the water. They're frolicking, yes, they all have their bathing suits on, frolicking in the dunes, yes, absolutely. All right. So, first son, Ted, was born in 1942. He is in the upper, I think he's the second. Yeah, he would be the second boy in that picture. That's a picture from 1948. So yeah, he was born in 1942. And when Ted arrived, it was time to leave the tiny one-room cottage. Hender Long Lumber Company of Crown Point built their comparatively spacious one-bedroom apartment above the studio and camera shop, which is the property that you would still see on the north side of the lake. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, you would have passed it, yes, on your way over. In the next few years, by 1951, two more sons, Fred in 44 and Edgar in 47, and daughter Linnea in 1951, arrived to fill the small home with a bustling, busy family of six in a one-room apartment. Things, times are different. Uh, yes, and you'll notice Linnea, um, the, the uh, daughter, was named after her maid of honor, Linnea, when I had read that article. So yeah, I thought that was a very, very nice little <laughs> touch there. Florence and Gus worked tirelessly at growing the photography business as well as raising their children with love and attention to every part of their lives. Living on the lakefront, the family made great use of all water-related entertaining possibilities in every season. She was also a Cub Scout leader during the boys' youth, and at the studio, Florence and Gus were on the ground floor of color photography and started the business of taking candid wedding pictures, which I thought was a neat little detail. Uh, Florence also found time somehow for gardening, reading, sewing, watercolor painting, listening to music, and driving, which it says she enjoyed, which she loved to do well into her 80s. I don't have a lot of pictures from this next section that I want to read to you about, which is getting really into the detail of all of Florence's civic involvement. So I'm going to leave the screen of the family up, but let me tell you about the rest of the pictures here and who is who in which photograph. So on the top, top left, we have, like I said, Fred, Ted, Florence, and Gus. And then down here is actually a picture of them in that one room studio apartment. So we have Ted, Fred, Gus, Linnea, Florence, and Edgar. And then this older picture, that is 1965. Edgar, Fred in the middle, and then Ted, Gus, of course, Florence, and Linnea. So I'm going to leave the family photo up here for you to gaze upon while I just share a little bit about the details of why we chose Florence to, to present on a lot of the contributions that she made to our community. As a busy wife, mother, photographer, and business partner, she still also managed to find time for community service in abundance. She was one of the founding members and the first president of the Cedar Lake Business and Professional Women in 1949. One of the greatest concerns that Florence and the BPW shared was cleaning up Cedar Lake. In 1960, there were plans for a cleanup campaign that was going to be held in May, and it began with a parade on May 15th that started the event. Florence was the parade chairwoman, and the event was a coordinated effort between the BPW and the South Lake County Disposal Service, the first one of its kind here. And as part of this event, her husband Gus assisted a committee in the judging of pictures. The South Lake County Disposal Service haul away trash for free. One of the most crucial moves that the Cedar Lake BPW made was stating that the organization favored the proposed incorporation proceedings in 1963. And I believe we're going to hear more about this when we cover Dr. King in March. Um, BPW voted to donate $25 toward the activity and to consider it the club's civic project for 1964. The BPW, like many other organizations, favored town incorporation so that the sewer system could be installed. Much of this had to do with Florence's role in the organization. Throughout her 50 plus years as a dedicated member of this organization, Florence and her husband Gus put on picnic suppers at their home when meetings were held there. The meetings did not just include business, but also social time, which reflects the friendly, kind, and helpful aspects of Florence's personality. Besides serving various offices within the Cedar Lake BPW, Florence also served on several committees. In 1960, the Cedar Lake Public Service Corporation was organized with Florence as its president. This group desired to reach all the people in the lake area to explain all the phases of the proposed sewers for Cedar Lake project. And during the attempt to incorporate Cedar Lake as a town, Florence was chosen to serve as one of the seven inspectors that helped plan the town's first election in 1964. 
She lost Gus in 1967 at the age of 74. He had exposure to mustard gas while in World War I. So that left Florence to continue the studio with the help of her sons, Ted and Edgar. After Florence's son took over the studio, there was more time to spend with the BPW. People who knew Florence commented that she was always ready to try to do something, and she would say, let's get it done. Although the Cedar Lake Chamber of Commerce wasn't charted until 1971, meetings actually date back to the 1950s, and you will not be surprised to learn that Florence had a hand in helping to found this group as well. Those at early meetings discuss how to bring local business community together, and Florence was one of the most appropriate to be involved, being the wife of a businessman and a businesswoman herself. In fact, she served on its first board of directors. The chamber encourages members to improve their properties to continue to attract patronage, and they were very influential in the development of the town, enhancing the tourism industry, starting with the first 4th of July celebration. And one thing that Florence had done as a member of the Chamber of Commerce, this wasn't until the 1990s, she worked to improve the dam at the mouth of Cedar Creek, right over here by the town grounds. She also served as Chamber Secretary for many years, and was on the Nominating and Beautification Committee, and the Public Relations Committee. So very involved with the Chamber. Thankfully, she also had a great interest in community history, and she was a founding member of the Cedar Lake Historical Association, which was, of course, organized July 16, 1977. She was one of those who saw the importance of preserving this lovely Lassen's Hotel that we are sitting in, and the rest of the town's heritage. As a member, she served as a tour guide, a board member, and even one time, the board president. Again, she wasn't afraid to get involved and, and be in charge. One of her most important roles here for us was serving as our publicity chairman and she would send news items to the various newspapers and she was also involved in the preservation of many of the old photographs that we do have in our museum archives. Very, very grateful for that legacy. You will not be surprised to learn that Florence also proudly served the town of Cedar Lake as a town council member in the 1970s and the 1980s. She was on the board at the time that Dr. Robert King, again father of Cedar Lake, was on the council. And she, along with Dr. King and the other founders of the town, saw the importance of our services, like the police department, the streets, and that sewer system. This photograph here um, shows Florence on the parade. She was nominated as Citizen of the Year. So we talk about Florence has great civic pride. She wanted to share it with the rest of the community somehow. Other local women who shared that same vision were Eileen Hunley, Sue Summers, Karen Dowler, and Mary Joan Dixon. And from this group of women, the Cedar Lake Summerfest Committee was formed. And that was in 1981. The main goal was to bring people back to Cedar Lake to celebrate their memories and create new ones. The first Cedar Lake Summerfest was a coordinating effort between the Cedar Lake Park Board and the Cedar Lake Summerfest Committee, and it was started as a townwide picnic. It included various food vendors, a local band, and games for all ages. One important event at Cedar Lake Summerfest was the announcement of the Cedar Lake Citizen of the Year. There she is from 1984. Florence received that honor for her many contributions to the town. And that photograph on the right is actually a picture of her in our old kitchen um, here at the Historical Association. So looks like she was dressed as they used to do a lot for our events and activities, dressed in period wear. Um, to be able to do some of their presentations and whatnot. So a couple of pictures that didn't quite fit in other spots of the, of the slideshow, so I want to show these to you as well. On the left, we have daughter-in-law Susan, son Fred, so Fred and Susan are married, and then Florence in the middle, son Ted in the back there. Then you have Linnea and her husband, Art Henderlong. And that photograph was taken around 1985. Another little, little nice family photograph. The bottom one there, you can see the business professional woman's tent. Um, that was taken in 1992, so I'm guessing that was at Summerfest. And that is Florence on the left with her son-in-law, Art, and the grandsons, Ryan. And I think Dustin is the one whose little, little face is cut off there at the bottom. And this picture on the far right, it almost looks to me like maybe one of the photographs she would have taken is you know, running for town council or something like that. That's a little headshot of her from 1990. Recognition for her tireless efforts included, like I said, Woman of the Year by the BPW, the Parade Marshal for the Cedar Lake Fourth of July Parade, a key to the City of Crown Point by then Mayor James Forsythe, and being recognized at the 2001 Indiana General Assembly by the Senate for her tremendous love and civic leadership that she exhibited for her hometown of Cedar Lake. 
This great honor was presented to Florence by Cedar Lake's own Senator Sue Lansky, who we're going to talk about next month. I want to read the um, I want to read the, the, the declaration here to you. I had to didn't have it printed out, but I do have it here on my phone. So this was from what date did I say 2001. I offer the following resolution and move its adoption. A Senate resolution to honor Florence Wahlberg as an outstanding photographer and a tremendous civic leader of Cedar Lake. Whereas capturing life through a lens dramatically changed the life of Florence Wahlberg and her local community. Whereas a resident of Cedar Lake for over 70 years, Florence Wahlberg found her passion for photography as a youth growing up in the beautiful environs that became a popular tourist attraction. Whereas, wed in 1937 to Gus Wahlberg, who was also keenly interested in photography, Florence and Gus opened the photography studio shortly thereafter, thereby starting the family business that continues today. Whereas, in addition to her interest in photography, Florence developed a love for Cedar Lake that led to her assistance in developing the Cedar Lake Chamber of Commerce in 1971, where she served for many years as the president. Whereas Florence's civic commitment also extended to her service on the town council and its plan commission, one of her crowning achievements included her efforts to obtain the sewer system for Cedar Lake. Whereas Geraldine Quartercrax, who we will talk about in February, a longtime Cedar Lake resident and former Cedar Lake clerk treasurer, best summarized Florence's community impact, stating, She's a goodwill ambassador for our town. Florence's volunteerism is the epitome of what every citizen should be. That's why she's held in such high esteem. And whereas, above and beyond her interest in photography and her civic involvement, Florence has found the greatest fulfillment and highest priority in her role as a mother of four children, as a grandmother of nine grandchildren, and as a great-grandmother of four great-grandchildren. Therefore, it be it resolved by the Senate of the General Assembly of the State of Indiana that the Indiana State Senate recognizes and appreciates the tremendous love and civic leadership that Florence Walper has exhibited for her hometown of Cedar Lake. Very, very nice honor that Sue was able to, to present to Florence. Well, let's see some of those grandkids as well here. We'll kind of cover some of them. When the grandchildren and great-grandchildren arrived, Florence made time for them without fail and was ready to help any family member or friend when needed, we are told from from reading her uh, memorial obituary. She was also intrigued by travel and took many trips with family and friends. So some notes here. On this side here, 1968, we have Florence with her grandsons, Drew and Jeff Wahlberg. The center photo was from 1984, featuring grandsons Ryan and Dustin Henderlong. Down here on the bottom, that was taken in 1993. That's granddaughters Natalie and Stephanie Wahlberg, Florence in the middle, and then grandsons Dustin and Ryan. The bottom picture there was 1980, that was Florence with her granddaughter, Wendy Wahlberg. And then at the far right, that was 1992, that was her first trip to Colorado with uh, her grandsons, Ryan and Dustin, and her long. So, what else do I want to share with you? This next slide. A couple of pictures from the golden years here. Florence spent her final years happily living with her children on the beautiful wooded property near Lemon Lake that she and Gus had purchased years earlier, spending time with her sons and daughters, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, filled her days with love and joy. Watching the trees grow, that's a little quote, watching the trees grow was a favorite pastime, along with looking for deer in the backyard and listening to the birds sing. So you can see Florence playing cars there, that photograph was taken in 98. And then in the center, playing the piano, that was taken in 1999. And then in 2004, that is with her maid of honor. That's Linnea yeah. Schmidt. So if you remember the um, groomsman, last name is Schmidt. So Linnea apparently married, I, I'm guessing, I'm assuming, I, I, I guess I shouldn't assume, but I'm not sure anyone's alive to still ask, um, that Linnea ended up marrying the, the best man from their wedding. So that is who her daughter was named after. So that's a picture of clearly lifelong friends, which I think, again, is a really sweet, sweet sentiment. And then these photographs here, we have a picture of her and her brother Wallace. She only had one sibling, her brother Wallace. That photograph was taken in 2000, I'm sorry, 1994. And then the next picture next to that was taken in 2004, and then 2006 and 2008. So those are some of the 
some of the last photographs that we have of Florence. And it states also again in her funeral memorial program, her thoughts often went to her parents, her brother, and her husband until she was called home on January 9th of 2009. And if you look around Cedar Lake today, several great reminders of Florence's efforts still remain. She once said, I hope I make Cedar Lake a better place. And I would have to say that of all the many improvements that occur in our town, they are in some way a continuation of all of the efforts that were started by Florence many, many years ago. And you'll see here the cover of her funeral program. This woman made a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely, what an inspiration. I have a few more quotes as well about her to read from one of the, um, one of the articles that was written um, after she had passed. This is her grandson, Ryan Henderlong, quoted as saying, she had a deep, intense love for her community. It just happened she landed in Cedar Lake and wanted to make it the best that she could. And we have another quote here from her daughter-in-law, Susan Wahlberg, she says, she wasn't one that sat back and waited for someone to do something. She'd be the one dragging the bag of dirt and a shovel at the front line, getting people involved. Oh, Marilyn Caper here of Cedar Lake, Florida, she says, Wahlberg ensured you knew where you stood with her. When she wanted to make a point, she made sure you understood what her point was, and then she helped you to carry it out. People characterize the energetic Wahlberg as quite a lady, adding she was forthright, witty, and caring, providing a role model for granddaughter Natalie Wahlberg. She was, a, she was in a very public role with her civic work, and she always had a kind word for everyone, Natalie said. She forced me to conform, she forced me to conform to a higher way of conducting myself. Everyone seems to care because of all that she'd done for this town. Really sweet sentiment. So with that, we conclude our formal portion of the presentation.